Welcome to the ABA Journal Legal Rebels podcast, where we talk to men and women who are remaking the legal profession, changing the way the law is practiced, and setting standards that will guide us into the future. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the ABA Journal's Legal Trailblazer series. My name is Victor Lee, and I'm a legal affairs writer with the ABA Journal. Today, I'll be chatting with Craig Ball, a trial lawyer, computer forensic examiner, law professor, and noted authority on electronic evidence. Craig's practice consists mainly of serving as a court-appointed special master and consultant in computer forensics and electronic discovery, and he has provided testimony and guidance to lawyers, judges, and jurors in some of the most challenging cases in the United States. He also runs a blog named Ball in Your Court, where he writes about e-discovery and computer forensics. It's great to have you on the show, Craig. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Victor. It's a great privilege to be included in this series. So even though I just ran down your bio, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Mainly, how did you get into the e-discovery field in the first place? Well, I got into e-discovery the way most do, and that I was a trial lawyer for many years. And in the process of battling large companies in products liability, crashworthiness, and pharma cases, it naturally behooved me to learn to manage the onslaught of discovery with technology tools. But in, in truth, although I was an English major as an undergraduate, as I'm fond of telling my students and uh, other lawyers so that they can not feel daunted by this technology, I've been passionate about technology for as long as I can remember, Victor. I was a guy doing breadboarding with discrete components, and my best friend was a soldering iron literally going back to the time I was seven, eight, nine. Given your love of technology, how is it that you ended up in law school? Well, I wanted to be an inventor all my life, and it was my thought that becoming an electrical engineer was the path, so I went to Rice University for that purpose. Uh, but what had happened earlier in life, that I, I should add here, is that when I was very young, I was about 1971, I think it was, I read an article in Ex Esquire magazine that helped me realize that my great love of the phone company could be expressed in another way, and that was by being able to build devices that would take control of the phone system, then an international monopoly, and allow me to manipulate it. Now, you have to understand this is a time before personal computers, before the Internet, before bulletin boards, before anything. And so the only network that one could play with was the phone network. So I did some research and found a listing of codes that could allow you, if you could duplicate them, to manipulate the long-distance phone system. And I started designing and building a device that came to be called the Blue Box. I wasn't the sole inventor of it, but my own design. And we're going back, as I say, to now I'm you know, 14, 15, long before I could drive. And kind of mastered that, became involved in a community of users called Phone Freakers, and then set it aside and went on with my life and went to Rice. And in the process there, uh, assisting some students who needed to make uh, phone calls and didn't have the money, I uh, ended up getting into some legal hot water. And I was fortunate that the authorities recognized that I was an experimenter and, and not a gangster. And in working that matter out with the assistance of a lawyer, I was able to avoid criminal prosecution, but I had to agree to get away from technology, which was uh, heartbreaking for me. Fortunately, the lawyer who assisted me also hired me because he thought I was kind of bright, and I became a law clerk. That led to me going to law school and becoming a trial lawyer. So I apologize for that long-winded answer, but in short, I became a lawyer to stay out of prison. <laughs> well, we're glad you didn't end up in prison. <laughs> um, that makes so, two of us. <laughs> so one thing that I, that I touched on in your bio is you serve as a court-appointed special master and consultant on computer forensics and e-discovery. So could you talk a little bit about what that entails? Like, How did you get into that field and why did you decide to base your practice around that? Well, when finally I figured the coast was clear, as it were, 20 years or so into my law practice, I could return to computers. In point of fact, I was an early adopter of PCs. And as a consequence of that, I became involved early on with bulletin board communications and then with the fledgling uh, pre-web internet. 
I started doing continuing legal education about how to use automation to assist you in your law practice, to use it for informal discovery, to do cyber sleuthing on the internet and so forth. So I became known in my area as a lawyer who got computers. As a consequence of that, judges would come to me and ask them to help them in cases involving electronic evidence, which was then uh, pretty new and, and very much unfamiliar in the legal practice. And so they began appointing me first informally and then formally to serve as a, a master or neutral examiner. That forced me or, or motivated me, I should say, to go back to school to complete my formal credentials in computer forensics, which had been my hobby and then became something I could train in and get uh, certified in. And that just, you know, led to an interest in the intersection of law and technology. My original involvement was much broader and I was involved in ABA Tech Show and, and other activities. But then I began to narrow in and hone in on electronic discovery and computer forensics. And it was just good luck. I happened to be an experienced trial lawyer and a person knowledgeable about forensic technology at a time when standing at the corner of those two streets was the right intersection to be. And we suddenly had a huge and growing need for people who understood the technology of electronic evidence. So to kind of piggyback off that, given the need for someone like you to come in and explain all this stuff to lawyers and judges and even jurors who may not understand it, but especially the lawyers and judges. Does it surprise you that there's still kind of a need for someone like that to come in and, and explain these things? Or have you seen over the last you know few years that you've been doing this, that there's been more of an understanding of technology from the lawyer's perspective? Honestly, it breaks my heart. I honestly thought that by this time, after all the effort that I've devoted and others have devoted to trying to make the technology more accessible to lawyers, that there would be a greater uptake than there has been. I, I erred. I underestimated the ingenuity and capability of lawyers on persuasion. And <laughs> they spend an enormous amount of their effort, energy, and brain power persuading themselves that surely they don't have to know this stuff. They're good lawyers. They know their way around a courtroom. They know how to take a deposition. So why should they have to understand stuff like hashing and forms of production and search technologies? It's not fair. And so they've been able to tell themselves this is somebody else's job. It's something you hire people for. And that whole process is reinforced because if you think about it, no one wants to draw the circle of competence in trial law in such a way that it leaves them on the outside of that circle. So judges reinforce lawyers, lawyers reinforce judges, the bar associations, the law schools. Everybody continues to tell themselves that they're competent, even though they don't understand the form of the most ubiquitous common form of evidence they must deal with. It's been heartbreaking to me, and it's a source of great frustration that even this far in, in the decades that I've been teaching this stuff, that I still feel like it's only a handful of people that have come around. So what do you think is the solution then? Do you think it has to be mandatory for lawyers to, if not learn technology, to at least understand it or take a certain number of hours of CLE every year? Like, what do you think is sort of the solution to this problem? Well, it's, it's a very hard question because once you persuade the lawyers that they need the information and they somehow carve out the time and resources to be willing to seek it out, there are very few options that will address the technology part of the game. You can go to CLE programs around the nation and hear other lawyers talk about the case law of discovery. The people who teach law tend to be lawyers. And lawyers tend to talk about the law. That's what they know. So we have this process of reinforcement that the case law of e-discovery, which is, is very relatively modest and, and simple to assimilate, is all you need to know when what I believe lawyers need more than anything is a solid rudimentary grounding in the basics of information technology. Not to be computer scientists, but to understand the nomenclature, the fundamental concepts of how electronic information lives, how it is changed, the forms that it takes, because without that fundamental understanding, you are easy prey for those who would take advantage of you and more importantly, you're not really equipped 
to be the captain of the ship, to steer the vessel of litigation by being able to understand all of the critical processes so that you can negotiate with a peer who is equally well equipped. Right now, the process is either you better know it, which few, I think, understand it as well as is necessary, or you have to hire someone. And that ramps up the cost of litigation impossibly. Gotcha. So I'm also going to ask you to take a look into your crystal ball, pardon the pun, and talk about what the future holds for the e-discovery field. Where are you seeing the e-discovery field and computer forensics in general? Where are you seeing that heading? They're really going in two different directions. Starting with computer forensics, we're seeing some fundamental, some really sea changes in the processes that have been historically computer forensics. In the old days of a few years ago, the analysis of a spinning electromagnetic hard drive involved technologies to be able to bring back data that was lodged in the unallocated clusters left behind as magnetic remnants and so forth. Virtually all of that is going away as a function of the advent of solid state storage at certain processes that that essentially juggle the data behind the scenes on solid state drives that make much of it impossible in terms of carving deleted data. And we are getting more adept uh, at being able to analyze the growing body of trails, of logs, and other sources, data sources. Now that segues into the changes I'm seeing in e-discovery. We are seeing an emphasis on tools, one button, Uh, simplification, the idea that advanced algorithms, advanced analytics are going to take the place of lawyer grunt work and to a certain extent lawyer judgments about relevance and what have you. There is some truth to that. Much of the the mundane mechanical work of lawyering will be and, and likely and can be replaced by advanced technologies. And I think ultimately that is a a good thing. But I I also think that lawyers are going to have to come to grips with the fact that the focus on the document that has driven the practice of law for generations before mine is going away. Documents are not where it's at anymore. Data is where the evidence lives. And so it's going to take a while for lawyers to move away from their document-centric approach to discovery trying to define everything into being a document, trying to turn everything that is ESI into what is essentially an eight and a half by 11 piece of dried tree paste, because that's not going to work anymore. The Internet of Things, the growth of interconnection via the cloud data is where the evidence lies. And so the ability to think in terms of data, not documents, and to not be threatened by the use of advanced analytics, but understand that it will free lawyers to go back to the judgment side of the practice and less the paper shuffling side of the practice. Great. So that was what I had for you, Craig. Thanks again for joining us. For the benefit of our listeners, if they wish to get in contact with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, they can go to my blog. That's ballinyourcourt.com. Or they can email me. It's craig at ball.net. Great. This has been the ABA Journal's Legal Trailblazers podcast. Victor Lee signing off. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalRebels.com, LegalTalkNetwork.com, subscribe via iTunes and RSS, Find both the ABA Journal and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, or download the free apps from ABA Journal and Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.